to be given by Dr. Sean Kelly, research scientist at Columbia University and a visiting research scientist here at Rutgers University. He is going to look at a different time frame from the one we had from the first talk today. He's going back into the Mesozoic. And uh, he's uh, going to be looking at uh, lake, lake levels in the Rift Valley basins here in, in New Jersey. We're going to have a local perspective on what the, what the climate was doing. And I'll turn the program over. Please welcome Dr. Kenny. Thanks a lot. All right, everybody, sorry, let me get my microphone set back up. Everybody can hear me okay in the back? Yes? Okay, a little bit louder? Is that good? All right, excellent. All right, so, good? Kill the lights. Get out of the lights. All right, there we go. Everybody can hear, everybody can see? Great, okay. So, my name is Sean Kenny. Um, I am a postdoctoral research scientist at Columbia University, and I'm also a visiting scientist here at Rutgers University. And the title of my talk is, What Can We Learn About Earth's Past, Present, and Future from Rock and Sedimentary Course from New Jersey? Ambitious talk title. Uh, hopefully we'll get to all of that, or some of that today. Um, and to give you a little bit of, of a background of who I am and my perspective on, on coming to some of the problems that I work on, uh, I graduated from Rutgers back in 2014, and as an undergraduate, I did several research projects in the Structural Geology Modeling Laboratory, where what we uh, tried to do there is understand how different materials uh, deform as they're pulled apart or pressed back together again. And then I went out to Columbia University to do a, a PhD, where my project focused on the formation of a certain region in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, and that's a picture of me up in, up in New Hampshire. Uh, and how that region may have related to one of the largest volcanic eruptions that ever happened on planet Earth about 200 million years ago as the supercontinent Pangaea split apart. Um, to give you, oh, there we go, clicking? There, it's advancing, okay. To give you some uh, sense of what I spent mo you know, about half of my PhD on was doing zircon ge geochronology and uh, rock chemistry. So I spent a lot of time hiking in landscapes like this, sampling rocks that looked like that, separating out zircons that were much smaller than the one that's shown right here, and then uh, spending some time doing different kinds of lab work to measure uranium and lead isotopes in those zircons to say something about how old those rocks uh, were. Uh, I've also spent a lot of time doing outreach and educational activities and involved in scientific drilling uh, workshops and, and in the scientific drilling community. Uh, and this is actually, I used to do this very, very frequently, and this open house is the first time that I've done something like this in person in almost four years. So it's good to be back in person doing that. <clears throat> now, to try and explain how I got interested in, in scientific drilling and learning about different kinds of records that are recorded in rock cores, um, I started working on a project back in, in 2016 uh, when I was a, a graduate student, still doing zircon geochronology. And I wanted to branch out a bit. I wasn't really uh, thrilled about the idea of being a zircon geochronologist, somebody who spends uh, their life dating zircons. Uh, and um, I wanted to think about what, what, what other kinds of research projects could I, could I get interested in and, and involved with. So I had some ideas about some outstanding questions about lake level cycles that we see in the uh, record that's preserved here in New Jersey uh, in a place called the Newark Basin. I'm going to introduce all of these uh, terms and topics in a bit. <clears throat> and that led to some proof of concept studies uh, using mostly core scanning XRF. And this is the instrument that I used for, the most, uh, for most of my PhD to uh, do some of this work, as well as an example of the instrument uh, that I'm going to talk about a little later on today. And uh, this led to some uh, successful proof of concepts which led to some, a successful proposal, which is funding a lot of the work that I'm doing today at the, at the Rutgers University Core Repository. Uh, to give you some context of what's at the Rutgers Core Repository, this is a facility that is run by Ken Miller, who's a professor in Earth and Planetary Sciences, and he's the director, and Jim Browning, also a professor, is the, is the curator here. And the ballpark estimate of the total number of cores that is at the repository here at Rutgers is about 20 kilometers. In terms of the cores that I'm working on in, in my projects here, uh, there's about 7,000 meters from the Newark Basin uh, coring project, which I'll talk about in a bit, 
another 10,000 meters, so 10 kilometers, six miles of core for, that was collected by the Army Corps of Engineers doing some, during some geotechnical projects back in the 1980s, as well as a number of core records from the Atlantic Coastal Plain. Uh, to give you a very brief overview of what our facility looks like present day, uh, this is an example of what some of these Newark Basin rock cores look like here on the left. This is an example of cores from a project called the Colorado Plateau Coring Project, which I'll mention briefly later in my talk. Some examples of what CT scans from these rocks look like, as well as an overview of what our spectroscopy lab looks like right now. And here we use X-ray fluorescence, so we're using the property of X-rays to determine the composition of rocks or really whatever materials we might want to interact them with. And I'll explain a little bit more about what we're doing in a bit. And I just want to take the opportunity right now to say that we have a lot of different projects going on. And this is actually a slide that I presented here at Rutgers at a, at a workshop a couple weeks ago. And I want to extend the invitation. If there's anybody in the audience here who sees something in this talk that they find interesting or that they might want to collaborate on, whether that's from an academic perspective, from an environmental perspective, uh, teaching, outreach, anything that you could think of, I'm, I would really like to talk to you and see what kinds of ideas uh, we might be able to come up with. <clears throat> and we work on a lot of different kinds of projects in the core repository here, uh, ranging from trying to understand the interaction between climate and really how solar system dynamics influences the way that climate is expressed in the geological record, uh, but we also have projects related to critical minerals research, geohealth applications, as, and student training and, and research. Uh, our lab has really grown to be a, a good place of experiential learning for students, uh, both in basic geology, but also more advanced uh, instrumentation and analytical facilities. And the focus of, of my talk uh, today is going to be entirely on this climate and solar system dynamics component of the research that we're doing. And I don't like text slides, but uh, and this is going to be one of the only ones that you see today, but it's going to be my take home messages of what I hope you get out of this talk. And I'm going to be going through a lot and I'm going to say now and I'll say at the end, I'm going to be around for a while. So if anybody wants to talk about some of these issues in, in more detail, I will be uh, around to, to do that. So first, I hope you go home from this talk. Real, with, a, with an appreciation that the rocks and sediments that are here in New Jersey host an over one billion year record of some of the tallest mountains, largest volcanic eruptions, mass extinctions, and modern sea level change. A lot of superlatives in that statement. Uh, and that when we study detailed records of these processes, we, we, of these, or when we do a detailed study of the kinds of records that are preserved in those rocks, we can gain a fundamental understanding of Earth system processes globally. Next, I hope you walk away from my talks uh, with an understanding that coring provides the opportunity to recover much longer records and capture the processes that we might want to try to understand over much longer time scales than we might be able to see in outcrops that you are probably familiar with driving by uh, all the time uh, here in New Jersey. Next, we're going to talk about the Newark Basin and how cores from the Newark Basin reveal an unprecedented record of astronomically paced tropical climate change 200 million years ago and provide the opportunity to understand ancient <coughs> astronomical processes. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the project that we're doing right now at the Rutgers Core Repository to further understand uh, set what some of these records might allow us to, um, to uh, apply to our understanding of, of, of the long-term behavior of the solar system. And we're also uh, actively involved in other projects that are both proposed and ongoing to further extend the kinds of records that we're looking at at different places in time. So to give you a very quick tour of the different kinds of rocks, just to kind of give you a sense of why the rocks I'm going to be talking about today might be a little bit different than the other rocks that you, that you see driving around New Jersey, depending on where you come from. Um, I'm going to start in, in the northwest corner of the state. This is just a geological map uh, of New Jersey. And in the northwest, we see some of the oldest rocks that exist in New Jersey. And many of these rocks are deformed. You can see that these horizontal layers at the Delaware Water Gap are, are tilted. Um, then at the, the, uh, a really nice outcrop on Route 23 in Newfoundland, New Jersey, you can see that they are, they're folded. Uh, there's also some of the oldest rocks that are in New Jersey at the, at the Sterling Hill Mine. And there's a great exhibit over at the, the Geology Museum. If you haven't had a chance to see it, please go see it. Uh, 
as well as records of, of ancient life. There's hundreds of millions of hundreds of millions of year old stromatolites, and these are ancient uh, algae uh, that build mounds, and we could see records of that in New Jersey. So it's really cool. So we have a record of ancient sediment deformation that occurred during the construction of the supercontinent Pangaea, and ancient life. Moving to the other side of the state on the New Jersey coastal plain, and I'm showing a video, and I'm going to take the, the opportunity here to plug the Rutgers Virtual Geosites, uh, which is something that Dr. Lauren Adamo, who's also the director of the Geological Museum, has put together, which are virtual field trips to go and see some of these features, uh, not in person, but as close to in person as you can get. And what I'm showing here is one example of a uh, boundary section of the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And what that represents in time is the time, the time before that boundary, dinosaurs existed, the time after, dinosaurs went extinct, and there's a record of the processes that contributed to that extinction within that boundary layer. And we can also understand, uh, we can understand how our coastline is changing in response to climate change by looking at modern sedimentary processes here uh, in New Jersey. Now, moving on to the central part of the state, which is where we're gonna focus in on for the rest of the talk, uh, I'm going to show a few different kinds of rock types that we might uh, observe. On the top, I have two examples of, of igneous rocks. On the right, this is the Palisades Cliffs that you might see crossing the George Washington Bridge on your way into New Jersey from New York City. And on the left, I have uh, Great Falls in Patterson. And both of these correspond to, on the right, an underground magmatic chamber, and on the left, a series of volcanic flows that occurred during one of the world's largest volcanic eruptions that ever happened uh, in time. And on the bottom are two examples of the kinds of sedimentary rocks that we might see looking around uh, in, this, in this region of New Jersey. On, on the left, uh, we see uh, coarser grained sediments. You can see large class and pebbles. And on the right, you can see uh, what appear to be some cyclical variations in the rock bedding uh, that exist. And actually this top here is the Palisade Sill as it's truncating and jumping uh, down through the, um, through the earth. So <clears throat> we might wanna ask, how did these rocks form? Uh, and understand something about when these rocks formed. So they all formed during a period of time uh, in what's known as the, the Triassic period, which lasted from about 250 million years ago. And, that, and it began with a mass extinction, the end Permian mass extinction. Uh, and it ended with a mass extinction, the end Triassic extinction. And as I showed you before, and I sh I'm showing again, at Great Falls and Patterson and in the Palisades Cliffs, we see uh, really spectacular uh, examples of the record of those volcanic eruptions. Now, <clears throat> how did these rocks form? So to answer that question, we're gonna go back in time to the supercontinent Pangaea. And 201 million years ago, it was in the initial, is in the final stages of breaking up to form what is now the Atlantic Ocean. And I'm going to show an animation beginning at about 250 million years ago, and I'm going to just show this looping for, for a couple seconds. And we see that at about, at about 250 million years ago, Eastern North America, which is right where my little cursor is, starts out in right very close to the equator and is moving northward as time progresses and, and until it makes its way to where we, see, where we are today here in Eastern North America. <clears throat> and in the late Triassic, as Pangaea was, was breaking apart, one of the largest rift systems in Earth's history developed. So you can imagine the crust stretching apart, the crust is breaking, holes are forming. Okay? And within these basins that developed, large lakes formed. And the largest of these individual basins is called the Newark Basin, which is where we're standing here. The, sed the sediments in, in that became the rocks in the Newark Basin are where we, where we are today. <clears throat> now, we'll see that rocks that formed from sediments deposited in this ancient lake consist of cyclical bundles. And I'm gonna show you some photos that, that demonstrate what appears to be an apparent cyclicity that you can observe in the rocks. And the main motivation of my talk here is to try to help us build an intuition for how to understand the origin of the cyclicity and importantly to test where it's coming from. What is the origin? Why do, why do we see this repeated pattern of sedimentary cycles through the rock record? 
And first, to get a sense of what this may have looked like in the present day, I'm going to show a satellite image of, of East Africa here. And you could think of the rift system that, it, that existed on Eastern North America as somewhat analogous to what we see in East Africa today and the lakes that exist there today. So two examples of the kind of lakes that we might think the Newark Basin looked like was uh, lake, or, or lake Tanganyika and Lake Malawi. <coughs> and these lakes formed in fault-bounded basins. They're relatively long relative to their width. And you can see that you know, that kind of looks pretty similar to what the Newark Basin looked like in terms of its dimensions and, and uh, based on our understanding of the tectonics of what's going on there today, explains why we, we see the dimensions that, we, uh, that are still preserved uh, today. So the simplest way to, to conceptualize these lakes is to just kind of imagine them as large holes in the ground where sediment accumulates. Um, they are bounded by faults on, on one side. The crust is splitting apart, breaking apart. A depression forms adjacent to the fault, and sediment comes in at a certain rate from rivers and streams. And we can very simply think, and it's more complicated than this, think of variations in, in the lake de depth that we observe as functions of, of rainfall. Now, I'm also going to take another opportunity to plug a really great Rutgers Virtual Geosite field trip of the Newark Basin put together by Roy Schlisha. And I encourage you all, if you want to learn more about how these basins formed, to, to go and, and uh, check that out. So in terms of East African precipitation, if we're trying to understand the, um, what, what our understanding of something that uh, exists today and how that might inform uh, our understanding of what was going on in the past, we can think of, of, of Africa and East Africa, and particularly in the subtropics, uh, where we see many of these rift lakes, the um, climate is very strongly in influenced by the monsoon cycles that exist and the variability in the position of what's called the intertropical convergence zone. And much like the eight lakes that are present in East Africa today, we would expect the ancient rift lakes of Pangaea to also be strongly influenced by variations in this type of climate dynamics. Now, what did this look like? What does a scene from late Triassic or early Jurassic life look like? So here is an image of the, of the dinosaur Dilophosaurus. You probably are more familiar with this image of Dilophosaurus from, from Jurassic Park. And you can see Dennis Nedry, AKA Newman from Seinfeld's rain jacket here as he's surprised. Um, but this is actually a, an animal that made one of the most common tracks that we can see in these, in these rocks that are preserved in Eastern North American rift basins. This is uh, the track maker Eubrontes giganteus. And here's another really beautiful <laughs> picture that captures what some of these environments uh, may have looked like. And this is a mural from Dinosaur State Park in Rocky Hill, Connecticut, from one of the other Eastern North American Rift Basins, the Hartford Basin, formed at the same time under similar circumstances. And I think that the, the title really captures it here. And it's you know, late afternoon in the late Triassic. And it's just like, this is what life, what life is like for the critters that are running around on, on, on the lake bed. They're going about their normal day. We have mountains that are, that are in the background that are bounded by a fault. We have the lake is moving down, the mountains are moving up. We have large clouds that are uh, above the mountains bringing in rainfall into the, into the basin. And as the lake continues to deepen, sediments accumulate, they get buried, they turn into rocks. And over several hundred million years, they get uplifted again and we can observe them today. And <clears throat> once we see them as rocks in the present day, we can begin to look at the record of deposition that's been left behind in the rock itself. And we notice that some interesting patterns uh, exist. And I'm sorry, this is a little grainy. It's not grainy on my, my screen. Um, but one of the things that, that might jump out at you in this is the alternation between these dark bands and light bands going up through the rock sequence that become a little bit more muted and hard to see as we go up higher and then come back up again. And <clears throat> we might want to look at another view of that. And we could see it again here. And I think this is, yeah, this is a little bit clearer. Um, and you can see again, the same basic pattern of dark to light to dark, getting a little bit more muted, coming back to dark again. And we see that in all the different kinds of rocks that we observe that were deposited in these lakes in the Newark Basin, even when they don't look quite as visibly cyclic. There's, there's a subtle, subtle patterns that are eye picks out in terms of color, in terms of grain size, that we can see, well, hey, maybe there's some, 
pattern that exists, and maybe there's some external control that's controlling the sediment deposition in, the, in these lakes when they were uh, originally formed, that's then translated into the rocks that we can observe uh, today. A final example that I'm going to show you of what I think is a really strikingly clear cyclic pattern that you can see in the kinds of rocks that are preserved in these basins. And you can see, oh, there's my cursor. There it is. There's, there's some people standing right here over by the darker layer. And as you go up, these, remember these rocks are, are tilting. They're tilting toward, toward the border fault of, of the basin. And we go from a, a, just looking at the color, black to gray to red to black to gray to red. And this is the kind of sequence that generally repeats itself almost everywhere you have the opportunity to observe it. And a lot of people have, have worked on this uh, for a very long time, uh, most notably Franklin Van Houten, who is a professor at Princeton, and Dean B. McLaughlin, at, who is a professor of astronomy at, at the University of Michigan. And, and what they did uh, many decades ago was work out the basic mappable relations of this. They said, okay, well, we can see that there's some repetition of these cycles. We can make predictions about where else we might be able to see them based on our understanding of the distribution of the rock layers in the, in the, in the area and in the region and be able to make predictions about where they are and can be translated into mappable units that we see on an on a early geologic map of uh, the region along um, Route 29 in the Delaware River. Now, this is good. You know, we can see that Maybe we can trace these cycles to different places uh, where we can observe them. But how do we really understand what's going on? What is, what is driving the apparent cyclicity that we can observe uh, in, in, the, in the rock record? So <clears throat> the best first way that this was uh, quantified was by, by, by Paul Olson in the uh, 1980s. And he came up with a, a classification known as depth ranks. So these, these are sedimentary rocks. We can see fossils in them. The color might be telling us something about um, changes in the oxidation state of the lake that existed at the time. We can see fossils. The kinds of fossils that we see in the rocks might tell us whether the uh, water was shallow or deep. And what, what he did was, and if you can think about this in terms of, of end members, imagine what are the characteristics that would describe the shallowest rocks that we can observe in this basin. So things like soils. If I see a rock and there's, and there's evidence of, of soils that formed, uh, perhaps roots where plants were growing, I can, have a, I can have a sense that that's a shallow environment, that, that those sediments were deposited in a shallow environment. And similarly, at the, at the other end member, if I see very well-preserved fish, I see dark rocks, I can, and a very finely laminated bedding in, 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 at the centimeter scale, I might have a sense that that's perhaps the deepest state that's being reflected in, in, in the rocks, the deepest lake level state that's, that's reflected in these rocks. And to show you uh, how this was applied to the rock record, and again, we're going to go back to the quarry wall that I showed you before, <clears throat> we can see this depth rank classification where zero is representing the shallowest possible lake state, five is representing the deepest possible lake state. And what this is doing is it is classifying the rocks in terms of their relative depth to each other. So we can see how there are transitions from deep to shallow, deep to shallow, deep to shallow, deep to shallow, deep to shallow that we see repeated throughout this record. The basic sequence, and so it's expressed a little different depending on where you are, that we see is, uh, Paul named this the, the Van Houten cycle, <coughs> named after Franklin Van Houten, who, who really did a lot of pioneering work in this. And the, the basic sequence that we see is a deep lake, that shallows, uh, I should say, a lake depth that is rising that eventually reaches the deepest point in which the lake, uh, lake existed, shallows again, and goes down to the shallowest point. And then that cycle repeats itself. So <clears throat> we can understand that in terms of the kinds of sedimentary structures that we see, the kinds of fossils that we see in those rocks. Uh, in terms of the, the depth rank characteristics that we use to uh, rank them relative to each other. And the interpretation is that these transitions are representing the expansion and contraction of a very large lake that we observe in the rock record. So 
<coughs> we can try to ask what kinds of processes might lead to cyclical variations in sediment deposition. And we have some familiarity with the kinds of cycles that we see on, on a regular basis in, in our own lives. We have days and nights. The Earth is spinning around, and the sun comes up, and the sun comes down. <clears throat> and you know, we know that it's warm during the day and cold, cold at night, right? And many of us have probably been to the beach, and we've seen, we've seen the tides. And there are, every, every day, we see four tidal cycles that are amplified uh, every month, depending on the position of the moon relative to the Earth and the sun. We also know that there are seasons, and we see changes every year, right? We go from the cold, well, which should be the cold here in, in the winter, uh, to uh, warmer again in the summer, and then back again to the cold, and this repeats itself. <laughs> And there's also cycles, that, and some of you may, may be familiar with, with sunspot cycles and solar cycles, and uh, a lot of work has been done trying to understand how these might uh, be reflected in different records of climate. And I'm going to just get you to pause to think about this and say, okay, in our modern analog uh, at, at Lake Tanganyika, we have sediment that accumulates at a, at a rate of about a millimeter a year. And the cycles that I showed you are on the order of several meters thick. So does it make sense for any of these cycles that we're familiar with in our daily lives to explain the patterns that we see in the, in the rock record? No. <clears throat> so what kinds of cyclical processes are occurring on longer time scales? Because you know, we, it doesn't make physical sense that the cycles that we see are from uh, seasons or from uh, changes uh, that, are, that we see annually. So we need to look at what processes could be operating on longer time scales that influence climate and produce the kind of cyclicity that we observe in the rock record. So, okay, good, the animations are working. So there are cyclical and periodic changes to the motion of the Earth that do occur on very long time scales. And this was really worked out by someone named uh, Milton Milankovic uh, back starting in the 20s and then really um, applied to try to understand glacial cycles that uh, Dr. Higgins talked about in, in his talk um, <clears throat> to how these periodic changes in Earth's orbit affect climate. And the three principal cycles that we, can, that we, that we know about um, relate to Earth's eccentricity or how circular Earth's orbit is around the sun, Earth's obliquity or tilt essentially how tilted is its spin axis relative to the orbital plane, and how is that wobbling through time, and its axial precession, which is how, wob how, is, how is the spin axis of the Earth wobbling uh, through time. And each of these have um, periods um, that we can resolve and that, that arise from uh, our understanding of astronomical theory. Uh, changes in eccentricity occur every once about 100,000 years, obliquity every 41,000 years, and axial precession about every 23,000 years. <clears throat> now, the, where this gets a little bit complicated, and, and all I'm showing here is how these values change through time. Present is on the right. We're going back in time towards the left. And this is just showing what each of these values are for the eccentricity parameter, the obliquity parameter varying from about 22 degrees to 24 and a half degrees, and the precession constant. And all of these together affect the amount of sunlight or, or solar energy or insulation, and I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably, um, <clears throat> that is received at a given latitude uh, on the Earth. And what's shown here is the, the variability of that solar energy at 65 degrees north latitude. Now, <clears throat> This is a very busy diagram. So we have sunlight is reaching the Earth. These wobbles in, in Earth's position relative to the sun are occurring periodically. Over, uh, so, this, so this graph here on the top is showing at different latitudes on the Earth at summer, summer solstice, June 21st, what the variability of that solar energy is at a given latitude, okay? Now, there's a lot of really interesting things to talk about here, but first, and, and I really wanna uh, 
I'm going to say this, and um, I'm just going to have you accept it, and we can, we can talk about the, the details of this uh, perhaps offline, is that we can understand these changes in insulation that we see um, by doing a mathematical operation on it to recover what the principal periodic components are that influence its, uh, its variability that we observe uh, through time. So all you need to really think about when looking at a diagram like the one on the bottom is that from an apparently cyclical observation for which we have some way of quantifying, in this case, insulation is calculated, this is a numerical value, but if, if we have some other way of measuring changes in climate, so John showed oxygen isotopes from the uh, um, deep sea sediment record before. This is the same principle. So that's, that's one example of a climate proxy. Depth ranks are an example of a climate proxy. If we have a way of measuring that through time, we can apply this mathematical technique to it and be able to resolve if there are periodic components in it that if we then have some time control can say what those periods are and whether or not that makes sense in terms of um, any kind of astronomical processes that are influencing them. Now, <clears throat> the, way, the way to read this diagram is, these, this is a, what's called a power spectrum, and the mathematical operation that's done on each of these curves is showing what the principal periodic components are that um, compose them. So at different latitudes, different Milankovitch cycles, eccentricity, obliquity, precession, have a greater influence on the shape of those solar, solar variability curves. And in particular, at, at low latitudes, you can see the zero degrees here, um, precession is the dominant control, and obliquity almost has no role in shaping the variability that we, that we see. So how do we go from, we have cycles that are producing changes in solar energy that we see at, given, at a given latitude to a climate proxy that we can then do some math on and then say whether or not this has something to do with astronomical pacing or an astronomical influence on climate. So we can have, we have Milankovitch cycles which are producing the insulation uh, that's received at a given latitude that is influencing climate in all kinds of ways that we don't truly understand. We have some sense of how this is working, but, but there are uh, non-linearities that exist in the system that um, obscure a, a really complete understanding of, 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 of the processes involved. That climate sig uh, signal is then translated into the depositional environment somehow. So you know, we have our lake level. So how, is, how are these changes in climate being recorded in that depositional system? And then we have a rock record today that we then observe these cyclical variations and we're trying to back say, well, can we, can we understand the origin of these cycles? And there's a lot that can happen to sediments before they become rocks that might obscure our understanding of, or our ability to have reliable ways of quantifying those uh, changes. But when we apply this approach to lake level proxy data from Newark Basin outcrops, outcrops, and going back to the quarry section from before, uh, we can see that, um, so, so what was done, so we have, again, depth ranks that are classifying relative changes in, in lake level. And there's some age control on this by uh, looking at the very finely microlaminated sediments that exist in the deepest lake, what's interpreted to be the deepest lake cycles in, in these sections to get some kind of time control. If you could get a sedimentation rate, you can say how much uh, time is present in a, in a given thickness of, of, of rock. And the punchline here, and this is another one of, one of, one of those power spectrums uh, that I talked about before, is that when we do that mathematical operation on the climate signal that we, that the, the climate proxy record that we get from depth ranks, so this is this variability here, we can recover with age, con and, and with age control know what the principal periods are that are pacing that climate change. And you can see that the 100,000 and 20,000 year periods are recovered very well in that record. And going back to the basic structure of one of these cycles, the results of this analysis implies 
that the expansion and contraction of these very large lakes occurred with a period of about 20,000 years paced by precession. So I'm going to first pause right now and sum up where we are with our understanding of how these, of, of how cyclical processes are uh, affecting lacustrine sedimentation and how that's reflected in the, in the rock record based on outcrops. So we have periodic changes that are occurring in Earth's orbit affect climate, and this can be expressed in the rock record through cyclic changes in climate proxies. And that's true today. Yes? How long does it take for, uh, for sediment to turn into rock layer, which you then attribute to the time variable? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a long time, and, and there's, there are issues like compaction that have to be dealt with, and, and those, are, those are issues that we can't get into right, right now, but there are ways in which we have an understanding of and correcting for how sediment compaction and burial and how that translates into our understanding of the age. Yeah. I'm sorry? The PCA analysis does not say what's happening now for the last 200 years. Not in this record, no. No, yep, yep. So then in the late Triassic, analysis of the lake depth proxy records coupled with age models, and there are different ways that we can date the sediments in these cores, or in, the, in, these, in these rocks, um, demonstrate that the observed cyclicity in the rock record is consistent with the effects of orbitally paced climate change. And at least from the outcrop record, the periods of those orbital components recovered from that proxy data don't appear to differ significantly from their modern values. And that's interesting, because we don't necessarily have a reason to expect that this kind of uh, forcing should uh, show up as clearly as it does in ancient uh, rock records in, in time. So why would we want to core this record? Okay, we have these nice outcrops. We think we understand what's going on in terms of climate. Um, why don't we just call it a day uh, and, and go home? We've, we've done it all. Uh, so some of the things that, that, we, can, that we can learn from, from coring this record is to test whether the apparent orbital pacing of climate as reflected in this, these cyclical lacustrine strata occurs over the entire length of the record, uh, which at, at the time that this initial work was done was thought to be about 30 or 40 million years, to test whether the periods of the orbital components observed are stable or are they different, is the 20,000 year cycle that we see from analysis of rock outcrops the same from analysis of different rock outcrops? That might be reflecting a slightly different environment. And then from this record, stitching together all of the different uh, rocks in space and then translating it to time, can we develop a continuous time scale for this period in Earth history and have a record uh, of what, of what um, that can be correlated into from different parts of the world. So this was the motivation for something called the Newark Basin Coring Project uh, that was led by Paul Olson of Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia and Dennis Kent at the time Lamont Doherty and then uh, he became a professor here at Rutgers. And this occurred over about 1990 to 1993. <coughs> I was two when this started, so I was not, I was not involved uh, in this. Um, so this is uh, another view, geologic map, of the Newark Basin showing the position of the different cores. And you can see these crosses here represent the Newark Basin Coring Project cores. This line here represents another set of cores that was taken by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, in a project in the 1980s. And together, this record represents uh, 7,000 meters for the, about 7,000 meters for the Newark Basin and another 10,000 meters for the Army Corps of Engineers, about 17,000 meters, well, yeah, 17,000 meters of rock stratigraphy that can be correlated and composited into a complete stratigraphic column for this time period. So <coughs> coring on land um, f as a part of this project, um, you might recognize some of the localities that are uh, listed here, Rutgers 1 and 2, that was on Livingston campus, Somerset, Titusville, Martinsville, Nursery, and Princeton were cored in succession one after another, after another, after another, over a very short period of time. And uh, a fun anecdote that uh, Paul Olson's told me is that they were doing the mapping to try and figure out where to put the drill uh, next and to move the drill uh, while 
one was, was working. So as they were drilling at Rutgers, they were figuring out the map relations in and around Somerset and then uh, to figure out where to, to drill the next hole. So it was kind of a, a breakneck pace, as I understand it, uh, for them. So <clears throat> when we look at the cord record that we can recover from the Newark Basin in terms of uh, an idealized cross-section of, of what this ancient rift lake looked like, uh, we can see that instead of drilling one long hole in one place, uh, they drilled seven different holes. And, and the reason for that is uh, money, uh, is, is, is one reason but also the complexity of the geology. All right, if you drill one hole in one place, very deep, th there might be things occurring at the subsurface that you can't understand from the map relations that you, that you see uh, on the surface and, to, and that you can infer from, from outcrops. So, so to get around this, what they did, as I mentioned, was they, they developed a very good understanding of the geological map relations at each locality, and then cored to some depth, and then moved up, up the section in the basin, and along the way, getting younger and younger and younger and younger and younger rocks, okay? And <clears throat> these cores today live at the Rutgers Core Repository, and this is just a, a snapshot of one wing of where these cores are, and you can see that there's, there's a lot of them. Um, and all, all of the cores that you see here in the cardboard boxes were collected as a part of this Newark Basin coring project, and all of the legacy cores collected by the Army Corps of Engineers live here uh, as well. And the two principal goals and the two initial sets of measurements that were made on these cores as a part of the Newark Basin coring project were applying that lake depth classification scheme, and this is just a, a range of those depth ranks as they appear in the cores to try to understand how, um, to try to understand the relative changes in, in lake depth from shallow lake to, to deep lake, <clears throat> as well as a paleomagnetic record. And this is important for constructing any kind of uh, time scale and to be able to correlate to different sedimentary records globally. And the way that this works, it takes advantage of the fact that Earth's magnetic field flips back and forth and that, re those reversals are not periodic. Therefore, the barcode that you could generate, and you could see this, this, uh, this barcode here, black means that it's a thickness that where the uh, Earth's magnetic field is the same as it is the present day, or so-called normal, and white is reverse. So stitching together this record of, of magnetic reversals gives us a unique fingerprint in time that can be used to correlate. And this is done by uh, drilling into the sample. And I'm showing an example of, of, of one of the cores uh, from the Newark Basin Coring Project of what one of these holes look like. And <clears throat> together, the, the, the principal data set that came out of this project back in the 1990s was a record of lithological changes that observed in these rocks, a semi-quantitative characterization of relative changes in lake depth that we can get by observing what those sedimentary fabrics and characteristics are in the cores, coupled with a magnetic stratigraphy. So how does Earth's magnetic field vary through the thickness of rocks collected as a part of this project? And then together, translating that into uh, time. To give you a sense of scale of how much more information we get from cord records versus outcrops, this is just another um, flashback to the quarry section that we, that we looked at before. And you can see in, in the quarry section that we had, we thought we had a lot of cycles that we see, but really that's just a very small component of one section of the core at the lo locality of nursery. And you can see that the entire section observed, described, and on which um, our basis for a, a large part of our basis for understanding these Milankovitch cycles in the Triassic really is a very small fraction of the record that exists. And that through cores, we can examine continuously in time for a very long period of time. <clears throat> now, we talked about the 20,000 year cycle that's expressed, the, the kind of basic cycle that we see uh, in, in the rock record. Uh, 
And you noticed from the quarry outcrop that maybe there was some uh, variability in the, in the expression of that. The, the, the dark shales uh, get a little bit more muted as you, we went up the, up the wall. And in fact, these cycles themselves are bundled into larger stacks of cycles that are modulated by different, uh, by the eccentricity period of, of, uh, of Earth's orbit. And <clears throat> we could see that the 20,000 year cycle over 100,000 years has a, uh, a pattern where it's deep, not as deep, a little less deep, almost gone, and then, and then back again. And again, that pattern itself is modulated where we see bundles over a period of about 400,000 years that the expression and really the, the variability in lake depth changes uh, through time. And these are all um, a function of how uh, precession is being modulated by, by eccentricity during this time. So this is the time scale that was constructed from this, from this rock record. And this is, this is a, a lot, uh, and I'm mostly just showing this to you to give you a sense of how much rock was re recovered from here. You could see each of the holes, Princeton, Nursery, Titusville, Rutgers, Somerset, Weston, Martinsville, the Army Corps of Engineer record that's shown here, and then the record from outcrop in the Newark Basin stitched together gives a composite lithologic sequence in, in thickness. And, and you can see that this is a, a very, very thick sequence that when we have some understanding of the, of the cyclical patterns that exist in, in that rock record, and when time series analysis is done on those patterns, that thick, and we have some sense of, of age control, um, those thicknesses can be translated into time and then coupled with the magnetic polarity stratigraphy give us a, an almost complete record from about uh, 201, 200 million years ago to about 230 million years ago. So together, this entire record from the Newark Basin Coring Project represents about 30 million years uh, of time. Now, <clears throat> another uh, way of, of looking at this and, and to, to maybe try and tune your eye to how, how to see some of these cycles, uh, this is on the top the composite record of that depth rank proxy. And you can see, and this is again over a very relatively small time period, from 220 million years ago to about 221 million years ago, variations in the precession cycle, which is uh, occurring every about 20,000 years, vari variations in the eccentricity cycle and the bundling of these precession cycles, that small e right there, and then further uh, modified by these large eccentricity cycles that occur about every 400,000 years. And on the right is another one of these power spectrums that shows you what the main periodic components that make up the, the signal that we observe in that climate proxy record. So how can we test if this time scale is, is accurate? I didn't talk at all about radiometric dating. You might ask, well, how do we, how do we know that there haven't been uh, erosional events that, that have wiped out uh, portions of this record and the cyclicity that we see might just be, um, uh, what, no matter what, when we, when we do time series analysis on it, we'll, 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 get, we'll recover these periods, but we're, we're missing perhaps large sections uh, of time. So that was the, the motivating factor for another coring project, something called the Colorado Plateau Coring Project. And the whole point, well, not the whole point, but a large point of this project was to test the validity of the Newark Basin time scale as determined from the astronomical variations that we see from the climate proxy record as well, and, and, and then to be able to correlate uh, with a magnetic record. Now, I'm not gonna get into any, any details beyond this other than it works, and the time scale from the Newark Basin is validated by a detailed study of the record that's, that was recovered uh, as a part of this project. So, we might also ask, what else have we learned about ancient climate by studying these records? So a, a really uh, cool and clever thing that was done in, in the last 10 years was being able to produce a record of CO2 uh, over this interval uh, by taking measurements in carbonates that exist in soils. Uh, Morgan Schaller was able to produce a CO2 curve, similar to the CO2 curve that we saw in the talk earlier today, for the Mesozoic. And the main point here is that CO2 was much higher than it was today. This is about 4,000 ppm 
the modern value is about 400 ppm. This is about 10 times higher carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere uh, than today. And what we see is a, is a, is a gradual decline as we uh, move forward into the, um, into the late Triassic and, um, and up to the, to the um, Triassic-Jurassic boundary. And then as something the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province is erupting, so these are those large volcanic eruptions that I was talking about before, we have a lot of volcanic gases that are coming out as a part of those eruptions, principally CO2 and sulfur dioxide. But the CO2 is contributing to these big spikes that we can, we can recover from that soil carbonate record. Now, <clears throat> we can start, you know, now that we have an understanding of CO2 and we can see how these uh, late depth cycles are, 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 are um, expressed in, in the rock record, we see some interesting patterns uh, that exist. So in general, the, the basic stratigraphy uh, revealed by the Newark Basin Coring Project is we see a large uh, fluvial component to the section at, at, at its base. So the oldest part of the record has a lot of uh, um, riverine and alluvial fan sedimentation that, that we see. Then periods of very large deep lakes. Then not as much variability, but still some deep lakes. Then as CO2 is going down, the, those cycles appear to be much more muted in their expression in the rock record. And then after the eruption of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, we see the variability in lake depth come back uh, again. And we can see this in the cores. And I'm just going to cycle through some image, images um, that we took with our instrument that's showing kind of the basic pattern. I'm not sure how well this is showing up here. The colors look a little bit dark. But we see mostly sandstones. And you could, I don't know if you can see these white specks that are in the cores uh, here. Those are very large. Uh, clasts that are that are in the rocks, f uh, f going into uh, periods where we mostly see dark gray and dark black rocks, to much more red where we don't really see much variability at all, and then the eruption of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province where we start to see some of those cycles come back again. So what about solar system dynamics? And this is kind of where I'm getting to right now, and this is what's motivating the work that we're doing uh, at the repository uh, today is that I mentioned that these cycles are modulated with periods of about 100,000, 400,000, and I'm saying to you 1.8 million years, okay? And <clears throat> what, is, what is causing that has to do with the long-term deformation of Earth's orbit as influenced by all of the other planetary objects in the solar system that matter. So from all, all the way to, to planets to asteroids affect how Earth's orbit is deformed over very long time scales. This is a, a slide, and, and I'm really just going to ask you to, to look at the top left uh, of this that's showing how Earth's orbit is moving in the plane. And it's kind of like a hula hoop moving around. And that's one way in which the Earth's orbit is deformed. And that's called the precession of perihelion. And then it's also wobbling when we look at it edge on in the orbital plane. And that's something called nodal precession. And we can represent all of the different um, cycles that we see, these eccentricity cycles and precession cycles and obliquity cycles, by looking at um, what the, the frequencies of how these orbits are, 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 are uh, changing through time. I'm not going to be able to get into exactly why that is, but I'm going to make the point in saying that from sufficiently long records of climate, we can empirically determine what these values are based on our understanding of the periods of the cycles as they're expressed in, in, in the record. So. <clears throat> John talked about um, the oxygen isotope record uh, from the um, more recent uh, sediments from, from um, marine organisms. And that's what's a, a compiled record of that is shown here. And when we do mathematical analysis of that record and look at what are the major periodic components of it, we see that there's 100,000 year periods that correspond to Earth's eccentricity. We see in the Newark record, which is shown here in the middle, that we see very similar periods that can be recovered. But there's a major difference. 
And in the modern, the long period cycle that's modulating the expressions of these smaller cycles is about 2.4 million years in modern sedimentary, sedimentary proxies of climate, and it's about 1.8 million years in the Triassic. And we can look at this, and, and, and the point that I want to make here, and this is a very, I call it the spaghetti diagram, is that these are astronomical models of how the period of that long, long modulate, it's called the long modulating cycle, changes through time. And from the present day to, to about 50 million years ago, all of the astronomical solutions of what that period should be agree. And then after 50 million years, they fall apart. So why do they fall apart? And two reasons. Number one, when we're trying to model the motion of the planets in the solar system, there's only so well that we can measure all of the things that we need to measure to describe their orbital trajectories today. And second, we can only understand so much about the initial conditions of, of their motion in the solar system because we can't go back in time four and a half billion years ago to see exactly how things formed and how they were moving at that time. Um, however, this black line here is an astronomical solution that agrees very well with the period of this long modulating cycle that we see in the, in the Triassic record. And the entire window over which we have cores might allow us, if we had a sufficiently high resolution climate proxy, allow us to see how that changes through the record, as well as to be able to look in more detail, for example, counting out precession cycles in this record. That's something that we can't do because most of the variability in terms of the lake depth proxy exists in about a six million year interval from about 222 million years ago to about 216 million years ago. And this is related to that CO2 story that I was telling you about before. And as we get younger into the, into the record, most of that variance that we see observed in the lake depth proxy goes away, okay? So we might wanna know, um, are there any proxies that can recover the climate signal in this record? If yes, can those proxies recover the climate signal from time intervals where no apparent variability exists in the proxies that have been traditionally used to understand climate, so color, depth rank. If we can recover and generate uh, climate proxies from intervals of low variability in this record and demonstrate an orbital component, can we place empirical constraints on solar system dynamics in this interval? And from that, can we further understand, uh, further, further inform our understanding of the interplay between CO2 and orbital dynamics on, the modula on its modulation of Earth's climate system and influence on life? So looking at uh, section of that record here, you could see, and this is something that you, you should be able to, that should be uh, somewhat apparent if you're, if you're not colorblind, and I am colorblind. That's actually kind of how I got into using other proxies besides color to, to understand this, uh, is you can see that there's a lot of uh, variability in this portion of the record that disappears al almost altogether when you go into the higher section. So is there, is there anything that we can do to try to recover the climate signal in these intervals where no other uh, proxy uh, reliably captures the variations in climate. And this is just an example of, of some proof of concept work that I, that I did a couple years ago, which shows that yes, as we see in intervals of high variability, we can recover those basic Milankovitch components from analysis of chemistry in this case, um, and through analysis of chemical variations in the cores, we can also recover those same periods in intervals where it's not possible with the traditional uh, proxy, proxies that exist. So this led to our project that I'm, I'm leading now here at Rutgers, where we're using core scanning XRF to generate continuous chemical records throughout this entire sequence to try to see if our understanding of changes in chemistry, as those are reflecting changes in the depositional environment, as those changes in the depositional environment are uh, reflecting changes in climate, as those changes in climate are reflecting astronomical signals, which themselves are paced by these orbital parameters. So there's a lot of layers here to get from what we observe to the process, fundamental process that we're trying to understand. And what we're doing is generating continuous measurements on, on these cores. So um, Mike, I see you in the audience. You're in the top uh, right there. So we've had a lot of uh, student involvement um, working on these cores. Uh, feeding, it, feeding these cores through our machine here, which uses uh, X-ray fluorescence. And you can see that this is, uh, where's my cursor? On the bottom right, 
as an X-ray fluorescence detector. And this is just a way that we can use X-rays to measure the chemical composition of the rocks. And it allows us to do this uh, at a, on a realistic time scale and a realistic budget for, for producing chemical, chemical records from these, from these cores. Um, this is what they look like. So there's a lot of uh, work that's involved in preparing these cores to make sure that they're all stitched together. There's, David's also in the audience here. Um, and this is him puzzling a core back together so that when we put it in our machine, that we have continuous measurements across the surface of the core. And this is uh, our kind of conveyor belt operation that we, we established to, to be able to generate these um, measurements. Mike and Juliana here in the, in the audience, uh, placing either taking a core box out or placing a core box in, I'm not really sure uh, based on uh, that. And then here's the final box of Newark Basin core that's, that's going in um, that we completed the initial scans uh, late, late, late last year. And the kinds of data that we're generating from this record, and this is an example from the Rutgers hole, is element, elemental data. So we're looking at variations in elemental chemistry over the thickness of the record. Each hole, we did two sets of measurements, every centimeter. So every single hole we, that, that are about um, 1,000 meters long, we have about 100,000 measurements, times two, because we did it twice, so um, for each, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, plots here, represent about 800,000 800, data points put together, which is kind of, kind of cool. And what we can see is that there's a lot more information in this record when compared to the depth rank proxy. And we could look at relationships of those elements to each other, and I'm not gonna get into this, but there are ways in which we can try to understand what variations in those chemical elements or elemental ratios are telling us about the environment. So can we use some of these elements as proxies of uh, water depth or oxygenation in the, in, in, in the water column, grain size, uh, weathering rates? We did the same thing on the Colorado Plateau cores, and, uh, and again, I can't uh, talk much about this, but what we're, what we're doing here and is also what we're doing in, in the Newark Basin is looking at the incidental data that we're getting from our chemical measurements. We're producing uh, quantified measurements of things like arsenic and uranium and their occurrence in the bedrock, and we wanna try and understand how the bedrock distribution of those elements influences local um, health hazards. For example, if you're uh, living in, in and around uh, Hopewell, you, there's a good chance you have a reverse osmosis system in your house because there's arsenic in, in um, well water that's out there. So our current project status is that we finished measurements on, on the, both the Newark Basin Coring Project and Colorado Plateau Coring Project cores in November 2021, 20, not 21, 22. I'm clearly not uh, li living in the, the COVID time, time warp. Um, we are processing very large data sets as, as I showed you before. And this involves registering our measurements to the depths in the cores and trying to make sure that um, we're accurately logging those as we, as we go forward. <clears throat> we're developing models to try and understand how changes in the sedimentary chemistry reflect, reflect changes in, in, in the environment and how we filter out the effects of, of, of alteration on those sediments. And we're also developing models to try and understand how the integrated set of processes through geologic time that concentrate and subsequently mobilize these geogenic contaminants, contaminants that, that are originate in bedrock like arsenic and boron in the Newark Basin or uranium and arsenic in the Colorado Plateau strata. And there was lots of opportunities for students to get involved. So if you're a student here in the audience or online, and you, this seems like something that you might be interested in working on, please feel free to, to reach out to me. We also have several other proposed coring projects that are, hap that are um, in different stages of, of development, where we're hoping to get more cored records to try and understand uh, Mesozoic climate change um, uh, and the uh, overall evolution of the Earth's system uh, at, at this time. And th these are just examples of two projects that I'm, that I'm uh, uh, helping to lead, uh, a second set of cores on the Colorado Plateau, as well as a set of cores in the Hartford Basin at Dinosaur State Park in Rocky Hill, uh, Connecticut. So I'm gonna end with saying thank you to the Rutgers Geology Museum for having me. Thanks for your patience. I know that I went over time. Thank you to all the students who have helped uh, with me and thanks to the Rutgers faculty who have been supportive of this endeavor. Thank you.
I do the time. I'm, 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 I don't know if we want to do questions now, or I, I'm happy to stick around and uh, uh, take questions after, if that, if that might be, be better. I, I don't want to be uh, disrespectful of anybody's time. So maybe, maybe, maybe why don't we do that, and then we can, we can talk uh, in detail uh, offline. Okay. Thanks a lot.